this pandemic was just profoundly unfair for the reasons you said. So I was able to work from home. I'm in my basement. I'm still working from home largely. Uh, meanwhile, I have access to great healthcare. Meanwhile, I'm perfectly safe working at home versus the grocery store worker that I bump into who checks out my groceries when I go to the grocery store. He or she is a frontline worker, makes little money, maybe doesn't have health care, uh, and is also exposed to the virus every day that they're interacting with customers. And so this was a profoundly unfair pandemic in many, many dimensions. And we need to work extra hard to try to close the gaps that have expanded because of the pandemic. If you have a concrete slab in an inner city community and you turn it into a park, community violence goes down. Right, so um, can we actually demonstrate, and we, we have in some of these circumstances, that these social determinants of health, um, and when you make a difference in them, they actually lead to um, improved, out, improved clinical public health outcomes. Eviction moratorium, the same, you know, um, for, for the challenges we have with that, um, if you keep people out of congregate settings, if you keep them housed, they can manage to do other things in their lives. They can take care of their children. They can look for a job. They can put food on the table. They can quarantine um, in ways that are really important for public health. So I think we have to do some educating there. We definitely have to do some educating. And then we have to do some of these interventions and demonstrate they're working, and they are. Because I know that when racial justice advocates say we want an end to white privilege, that doesn't mean that we want white people to fear the cops too, or we want white people to have less access to healthcare or you know poorly funded schools, right? That's not what we want. We don't want an end to, to skin color privilege um, by bringing people down. We want an end to those privileges by making them the universal rights and benefits and privileges that everyone should have. And so we've got to actually say that and make sure that in our conversations, we are as much as possible um, offering a vision of the mutual benefit that will come in the society that we are fighting for. We had such epic news events that were so critical for, for folks to be able to get the right kind of information. So starting with a global pandemic, I mean, even saying those words seems, you know, crazy uh, back in February of 2020. Um, and we realized very quickly on that we had to um, get information quickly. Information was changing in real time. It was a matter of life and death. And then, of course, we also had, in the, as, the, as the year unfolded um, with the George Floyd mur mur murder, um, you know, an entire racial justice movement, um, law enforcement reform movement, uh, reckonings happening in media companies across the country and especially in newsrooms and indeed in our own newsroom. So that was, of course, a very big story nationally that also played out locally in a very big way. Um, and also the same thing, which is as a member of the community, you know, how do you stay safe? How do you participate if you want to protest? Um, what's actually happening on a larger scale. And then of course we had a major political year where Philly and, and Pennsylvania were at the center of the election. So, you know, it was the news trifecta. The American public doesn't need to be convinced that climate change is happening by reading a science document. They feel it, they see it, they understand it's happening. I think the, what, the work that we need to do together is to make sure that, that once, now that they recognize the challenge we're facing, how do we give them a sense of hope getting out of this problem? To me, I, I came from the generation where you think globally and you act locally, and it never left me. <laughs> I think the, the community foundations are a tremendous part of the opportunity and the hope that we can have for our future. So in many ways, this is at, could actually be the most significant community-driven effort that we could ever have. You know, demand electric vehicle charging stations. 
a demand that when you invest in school buses or transit buses, they're electric and not polluting with diesel emissions, contaminating our kids' breath, uh, air that they breathe. There are so many ways in which we could make this work um, at the community level that I think is what's necessary to personalize it. I think philanthropy has a number of roles to play. First, job number one is to get the resources out the door to do the utmost good, right? And I think philanthropy can be uh, self-reflective to see where, if you if you believe and agree with the sort of core ideas in the sum of us, philanthropy can use this moment to ask, how are we contributing contributing to cross racial solidarity in our grant making? Right? How are we creating spaces for coalitions that are multiracial and and yet are truly equitable um, to to exist in the communities that we want to serve? How is this zero sum logic playing out in the stakeholder and sort of you know business and government leader conversations that we are privy to that we are at the table at? Um, how has the, how has racism drained the pool in Flint, in Akron, in Toledo, in, you know, all of these places where community foundations are so active? Um, how are some of the core concepts in the Sum of Us playing out in the community? And how can we together start aiming for a solidarity dividend? You know, that those are the questions that I would invite for people who are reading the book or have read the book to be able to um, reflect on philanthropy's role. There are several prominent community foundations in big cities like Miami and Seattle uh, that have a local newspaper that's under considerable pressure but remains a for-profit newspaper. The Miami Herald is owned by a chain called McClatchy and the Seattle Times is a family-owned newspaper, but it's commercial. And they've nonetheless been able to partner with the Community Foundation, the Miami Foundation or the Seattle Foundation to appeal to the public to support specific philanthropic oriented public service journalism. That's one flavor. It's a kind of fiscal sponsorship with an asterisk, a kind of active fiscal sponsorship um, for for-profit newspapers. Uh, the second is something we're very excited about. This was led by the editors of the Philadelphia Inquirer, who felt that there was a, a growing void or what we call a news desert in Harrisburg and stories that mattered desperately to Philadelphia and the rest of the Commonwealth weren't getting covered because there were so few news reporters in, in Harrisburg. So we started something called Spotlight PA. The response from community foundations has been far and wide. And Pedro was very helpful in kind of leading the pack here. But so far we have Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, the Allegheny Community Foundation beyond Pittsburgh, Scranton, Erie, York, Lancaster and Harrisburg. So these are community foundations that are all giving, raising funds and giving to a statewide organization that has public benefit in their own community. That's very replicable and it's something that we'd love to work together with any of you on if you're interested. We need to get unvaccinated people vaccinated. Um, that I think is going to be extraordinarily key. We can't take our eye off that ball. That is really, I think, where community organizations can play such a key role. Um, because quite honestly, I think the people who are left unvaccinated don't want to hear it from me anymore. Um, maybe my message will help, but I've been messaging that for months and they need to hear it from other people at this point. I know all of my colleagues across the system believe that community foundations could be, are, and can be great partners with each other, but also with the Federal Reserve Banks to bring our best research to the table. They can help in many cases, take those ideas and put them into practice with their own partnership and their own charitable work. So I, I, I just think there are great partnerships there and more to be done. The move to nonprofit has really been gathering steam and community foundations can and should play a, a big role in that.
we need the community to do our work and you're doing such incredible work on our behalf and to and collaboratively and so for that i'm grateful because we, this is this is going to take a village and and we need your partnership as part of that village i'd love to see community foundations uh, do a do continue to do their work but do it in a way that recognizes that that it's it's not just mitigation which is the reduction of carbon pollution but it really is is how do you talk about these things as being immediately beneficial to people? You are powerful influencers. And so um, be active in your voice is what I would say, because um, people are not necessarily going to want to listen to me, but they will listen to you. So, you know, power in, in getting people vaccinated, the power in, uh, offering factual information against misinformation. So I think it's more, um, what I would say is more active um, because your voice is so very critical to these people. All of the systems that we have today, virtually all of them, are working exactly as they have been designed to work. They may not, that may not be the official slogan of the system, Right. but they're actually working as designed and as intended. And there are people who are absolutely benefiting from the system as it is today, delivering the outcomes as it is today. So why is system change hard? Because the people who are benefiting from the system today may tell you they want it to be fair and equitable, but they actually don't want it to change. If it means that the benefits that they're enjoying are not no longer so rich. So I would just say to the foundations, confront that. You are pillars in your communities. You are respected institutions in your community. Go force people to answer, why don't you want this to change? You know, it is not time for the best of us to be silent as there are attacks on honest education, right, in this country. Um, as there are attacks on democracy, as we are seeing people lose their lives because of disinformation and misinformation, right? We have got to, um, and when, you know, on the positive side, there is the opportunity, which, you know, bills are on the table in, in our federal government right now, in Congress, that would fundamentally address so much of the poverty and need and stress and want that community foundations have been trying to address in our little ways with our little amount of resources for so long, right? An historic investment in human infrastructure and in helping families meet the cost of childcare and elder care and deal with paid family leave and adding mental and, uh, excuse me, medical and dental to Medicare and great, you know, huge amount of funding for, for community needs. You know, that's what's in the t on the table. And why would we be silent now? <laughs>